Hello, my name is Valentina Helsi and let me introduce you to my group. First we have Fernanda Belmonte, Sofia Cázares, Zoe Bueno, Maria Gracia Ceballos Paz, Maria Elena Fagalde, Daniela Gómez and me again, Valentina Helsi. We have some questions regarding intonation. The first question is, what possibilities have proposed to study intonation with an attitudinal approach and what are the problems with that? Well, one of the proposals is that the analyst invents a large number of sentences and tries saying them with different intonation patterns, noting what uh, attitude uh, was supposed to correspond to the intonation in this case. But the problem is that the results are very subjective and they are based on an artificial performance uh, that has a little resemblance to the conversational speech. Now, there are three more proposals with their respective problems that Fernanda and Zoe are going to answer. The analyst could say these different sentences to a group of listeners and ask them to write down the different attitudes they think are being expressed. But the problem is that there is a vast range of attitudes available for labeling attitudes, leaving the analyst with the problem of deciding whether the attitudes are synonyms or if they represent different attitudes. The third proposal is to ask a lot of speakers to say a list of sentences in different ways according to the labels provided by the analyst and see what intonation features are found in common. The problem with this is that the results are very variable and difficult to interpret, not least because the range of acting talent in a randomly selected group is considerable. The last proposal is to study recordings of different speakers' natural and spontaneous speech and try to make generalizations about attitudes and intonation on this basis. The problem with this is that the analyst tries to select sentences whose meaning is fairly neutral from the emotional point of view. The choice of material is much less free for someone studying natural speech. We have been asked to describe and exemplify three types of suprasegmental variables that were described on pages 187 and 188 of the English Phonetics and Phonology course by Peter Roach. Maria Gracia and Daniela Gomez are going to describe this further. There are three distinct types of supra-segmental variable. They are sequential, prosodic, and paralinguistic. In the sequential type, the components of intonation occur as elements that are one after the other. They never occur simultaneously. Therefore, in this category, we can find preheads, heads, tonic syllables, and tails. We can also find pauses, and we can also find tone unit boundaries. And the prosodic type, it involves all the components of language that are present while speech is going on. They are width of pitch range, key, loudness, speed and voice quality. Now my classmate Daniela will explain you the paralinguistic type. Hello, my name is Daniela Gomez and I will explain the last type of the suprasegmental variables, which is paralinguistics. Paralinguistic is the study of the vocal and sometimes non-vocal signals beyond the basic verbal message. Its focus is on how something is said, not on what is said. Paralinguistic includes accent, fluency, speech rate, volume, and modulation. Here are some examples. The following intonation can be used to express definiteness. Like for example, I'm absolutely certain. Rising intonation can be used for general questions or for encouraging. A general question could be, can you help me? And an example of encouraging could be, it won't hurt you. Form rising intonation can be used to express doubts or requests. For example, you may be right, or can I buy it? And finally, Rice falling intonation can be used to express surprise. For example, all of them? We have also been asked whether we agree with the generalization for learners of English that are stated on pages 188 and 189, and which are more difficult or easy to learn. Sophia is going to address this. Yes, we agree. The rules and generalizations that could be inferred by conveying attitude through intonation are too trivial to learn. 
with the intonation of learning, the right use of, of attitudinal intonation by hard learners apply the wrong intonation in the wrong situation, leading to a different grammatical meaning or offending the listener. The complexity of the total set of sequential and prosodic components and of paralinguistic features is important, but also very difficult to teach and learn. The best way to learn the attitudinal use of intonation is by talking and listening to English speakers. In that way, learners can be more aware of how and when you use different intonations. Finally, Marilena is going to explain the concepts of stress and sentence stress in relation to intonation. The term accentual is a term derived from the word accent, a word used to refer to what is known as stress. When writers say that intonation has accentual function, it means that the placement of stress is determined by intonation. Another particular aspect of stress could be, re could be regarded as part of intonation. This is the placement of tonic stress within the tone unit. It could be suggested that while word stress is independent of intonation, the placement of tonic stress is a function of intonation. There are some older pronunciation handbooks that refer to this area as sentence stress, which is an inappropriate name because sentence is a unit of grammar, while the location of tonic stress is a matter that concerns tone unit, a unit of phonology.